Well, thank you for joining me for the next several minutes or so. We're going to jump into a passage of scripture here in just a moment. Before, though, thank you for your support jumping on our website, www.myfaithchurch.org. Thank you for clicking that donate button or as well uh, sending a contribution to 73256 to My Faith Church. All one word. We appreciate your support. Take advantage of some of the things that we've got I've made available for you on our website. Instructions about how to download the YouVersion Bible app. That comes in very handy. It's free. Uh, as well as create your own account from our account of Right Now Media. A wonderful resource where you can just dive into all kinds of various things. Um, things that obviously we just can't get to if we just come to you once, you know, once a, a week. There's all kinds of different subjects on there from Genesis to, to Revelation that we just hope you take advantage of. So, well, um, didn't necessarily intend to look at this passage of scripture that we're going to look at here today. Uh, and the reason why we are doing it is because of a couple of reasons. We sort of concluded our study on the prophet of fire, a guy by the name of Elijah. Uh, we've been spending some time on him in our teaching series called Fireside Chats, and we've been looking at the symbol of fire, and we're going to continue to do that. We're going to take a little bit of a break uh, for uh, November and, and December and probably pick that up uh, coming up in, in, in January. But uh, I wanted to end a bit last week on um, the prophet of fire, a guy by the name of Elijah, and we looked at when the when the Lord took him up into heaven in that chariot of fire and how uh, he was um, commissioning Elisha, sort of his his ment mentee, you know, a, a bit and what that means. And I intended to actually stop there, but uh, a handful of you actually came and said, "Hey, Matt, I think." You know, do you do you know Elijah appears in the New Testament? And I said, well, I, I know he does. Uh, and they kind of said very gently, and they said, maybe we shouldn't end this, and maybe look at those passages of Scripture where Elijah appears um, in the New Testament. And he certainly does, and it's in a particular place um, in Matthew chapter 17 called the Transfiguration. Um, and I believe he also appears in Revelation, I believe it's chapter 11, as one of the two witnesses, along with, with Moses, uh, in chapter Revelation during the Great Tribulation. And we might touch on that a, a bit here today. But but uh, as I looked at the, the Transfiguration, I grew up in a, there was a season of my life where, where um, my family, we went to a church where they celebrated every single year Transfiguration Sunday where they looked at this particular passage of scripture where Peter, James, and John, they they go with Jesus up on a particular mountain and Jesus is transfigured before them. And as well, we see Elijah and we see Moses there and it was a significant moment um, in their life. And uh, to my surprise, as I look back on my, on my records, I have never actually commented or preached on this particular uh, passage of scripture, which really surprises me because it is a major um, piece of, of the scripture. Um, in fact, if you grew up in a, in a tradition um, like I did for a season of life, maybe your church uh, celebrated Transformation Sunday, you know, or perhaps even Pentecost Sunday. And we're going to get to that as well because uh, symbols, tongues of fire, you know, we're going to get on that as well as part of our series, uh, Fireside Chats. But I wanted to take a moment twofold purposes. One, because I haven't actually looked at this passage of scripture with you, and I wanted to do so. But the second reason is, and we're going to have a dual purpose here today, we're going to teach you how to study the scripture for yourself. Uh, you know, this, the idea of we're not just going to give you a fish, you know, uh, but we're going to teach you how to fish. And so we're going to do a couple of things today. We're going to teach you from the scripture this very important passage of scripture called the transformation or transfiguration where Peter, James, and John saw Jesus in his divine state and what that means and the importance of that and, and the significance of that. But we're also going to teach you how to interpret really any passage of scripture by doing just very simple Bible study uh, practices here. So um, we're gonna do some observation and then we're gonna do some application and you can apply what you're learning here today, really on any passage of scripture that you uh, that you choose to look at. So dual purpose. We're going to look at the passage of scripture. 
Um, we're gonna give you a fish, but also in the process, we're gonna teach you how to fish by just doing a very simple Bible study practice called observation and then application. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 17. I'm just gonna read this passage of scripture. It may be very familiar to you, maybe it's not. Um, I was surprised that I actually have never preached on this and we're gonna correct that here today. But I'm gonna start here in verse one and just go to verse chapter or verse 13. And then we're just gonna make some observations and then we're gonna make some applications here. So no further ado, let me just start here in verse one, chapter 17 in the book of Matthew. Now, after six days, if you have your Bible, hopefully you're reading along with me. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah, that's why we're looking at this, Elijah appears in the New Testament. Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. When they lifted their eyes uh, up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come. And they did not know him because... Uh, did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Okay, now this is a very familiar passage of scripture. Uh, this is called the Transfiguration. It's here in Matthew chapter 17. So we're going to make some observations. We'll make four of them actually here today. And you can apply these, this method, to really any passage of scripture that you're looking at. And then we're going to make three applications from this. So let's go ahead. Let's jump in. Let's look at the first observation. And here's the question that we're going to answer. Where were they? And in the very first verse, this is what it says. Now, six days after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and his brother and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Now, Matthew places something in this very beginning part of this verse after six days. This is this idea, okay, where were they? We know that they're on a mountain, but what happened six days prior is this idea of context. This idea, okay, what was going on? Where were they physically? But also what was their emotional state? What was their spiritual state? What had they just experienced six days prior? Now, very easy to do this. You just turn the page back to chapter 16. And what we see is Peter's confession of Jesus being the son of man. It's a very important part. This is where Jesus takes his disciples and he goes to Caesarea Philippi. And if you go back to the back of your Bible and you look at the maps, right, it might be difficult to find Caesarea Philippi. It is a place that is way up north. No Jewish person would have gone there because it is a pagan area. It was, it was known for the worship of this, um, of the worship of Pan, uh, this half man, half goat you know, type of uh, thing. You may have heard the pan flute. You know, you may have seen uh, pictures or descriptions of this. It was a. It was an area that was known as literally the the gates of hell. There was a belief where there was a place, a cavern, a valley, 
uh, that and, and human sacrifices, child sacrifices were there. That's how pagan this area was. You throw them off this cliff into this valley. This is the gates of hell. It was like the bottomless pit. Now, why did Jesus take his disciples up there? Why did he literally take them to the place where people believed was a gateway to hell and say to Peter, who do you say that I am? And the reason why is because if Peter could say it here, he could say it anywhere. This is a horrible place. And this is where Jesus makes this statement and it makes sense why Jesus makes this statement. He says, Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus is saying so important here. I'm not telling you, I'm not asking you to say who I am in church. It's easy to say Jesus is Lord in church. But I am taking you to the worst place, the most horrible place in the world, the gates of hell. And I am asking you, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded correctly. He says, you are the son of the living God. Now, right after this, you know, Peter messes up. And he, Jesus is talking about how he's going to have to suffer. And he makes some strong statements about, if you want to be my disciple, you need to take up your cross and, and deny yourself. And, and uh, you know, you need to follow me. In chapter 16 of Matthew, he is, he is saying something. He's made a major switch in his ministry. In the early part of Jesus' ministry, the crowds were following him. And why wouldn't they? He fed them. He healed their diseases and caused the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear. And, and uh, he was very, very popular. But then Jesus starts to make some comments. If you're going to be my disciple, you need to eat my flesh. You need to drink of my blood. You need to take up your cross. You know, you're going to have to suffer. And it says that many of the crowd stopped following Jesus when he made those statements. And then Jesus takes his disciples on a little field trip to the worst place in the world, the horrible place, and says, Peter, who do you say that I am? And the gates of hell, I'm going to build on this, and the gates of hell will not prevail. That was a horrible, horrible place. And the reason why is because Jesus understood that his time was short. He wasn't going to be on the world in the world forever. He was there for a mission. He came to die. We know this. He was going to rise again. And the disciples, those who were left, were going to take this message. And he was making a distinction between just a fan of Jesus, like the crowd, and being a true follower of Jesus. We see that Jesus does this all the time. He's, he tends to try to avoid the crowds. And he loved the crowds. He had compassion on the crowds, right? But he also understood that the people that were going to remain, that were going to take this message, were going to be at the gates of hell. It was going to be tough. It was going to be a difficult thing to be a follower of Jesus. And he needed to pour into their life these handful of individuals. And that's why he makes these statements. So he goes from the most horrible place in chapter 16 to the highest place. He goes up on a mountain and he's about to reveal to them his divinity. Now notice the, notice the, the timeline here. In, in chapter 16, he's in the horrible place. And, and it was, if there's a place where it's difficult to say that Jesus is Lord, it's there. But now, once they've confessed this, he takes them to the highest place and reveals to him them in, in a dramatic way his divinity. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. And it doesn't require a lot of faith. In chapter 16, it requires a lot of faith to say, at that place... You are the son of the living God. In chapter 17, when he reveals himself, when he's transfigured before them, uh, boy, even if you were an atheist, you, you could not deny what you saw. And so we see that in chapter 16, faith, and we see in chapter 17, a revelation, an illumination of who Jesus is. And we need to take note of that, right? Jesus reveals himself in a special way when we, by faith, confess who he is. So in chapter 16, in the horrible place, chapter 17, in the highest place, Jesus is about ready to reveal himself in a special way. So where were they? They were at a place, the high place, after this horrible place, they were probably pretty discouraged. They were probably thinking, oh, Jesus just said we have to suffer. And Jesus rewards them 
for giving them, giving them a vision unquestionable of what they saw because a chapter prior, they had confessed by faith what they hadn't seen, right? Now that's the first question, context, where were they? And that's a good Bible study observation. You need to take whatever passage that you're looking at and say, what, where are they? Not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, what's going on, right? What is the context? Here's the second question. What was seen? What is going on in this passage of scripture? And it's revealed to us in verse two. And he was transfigured before them. This is a Greek word called morphe. This is where we get metamorphosis. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Now we know that Jesus appeared as a man. He was a man. But on this particular occasion, he allowed his divinity to be seen. You know, Jesus was always divine. He always had certain characteristics that we would associate with, with God. Before a period of time, while he was here on earth, he didn't give up his divinity, but he gave up some of the divine characteristics we know that God is omnipresent. He's able to be everywhere. But for a period of time, Jesus took on flesh. We know that God is um, omniscient. He knows all things. But for a period of time, Jesus took on flesh. And we read in chapter 2 of Luke, verse 52, that he grew in wisdom. He, he learned. And so for a period of time, he didn't place his divinity he didn't give up that, but he did give up certain divine characteristics. Now, on this particular mountain, he allows it all to be seen. And they have no doubt that Jesus is the son of the living God. They had confessed that a chapter earlier, and now Jesus rewards him by what they had confessed, by allowing them to see. It was this illumination. It's like Clark Kent taking off his glasses and saying, I want you to see me as Superman, right? And so he was transfigured before him. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Now, why Moses and Elijah? Why not David and Joseph? Why not Hezekiah? Why not somebody else? Well, Moses was the giver of the law. We know this. He is the one that wrote Genesis, Exodus. I mean, he wrote the five, the first five books of, of, of the Bible. He is the lawgiver, and we know that the law points to Jesus. We are incapable of following the, the law. The law is perfect, but the law reveals our imperfections and our need for a savior. And we see that Moses is the representative here. We see that Elijah is known as the greatest of the prophets and all the prophets point. Just like the law points, the prophets point. And so we see that Moses and Elijah is here, are here, and they are pointing to the divinity of Jesus that has just been revealed. So what's being seen here in this passage, the divinity of Jesus is on full display. So where was it? That's the context. What was seen? We see this. And here is number three, what was said? And we can apply this really to any passage of scripture. So let's look at verse three. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now, this is what is being said. We have Peter saying something, and then we have God the Father saying something. Peter said, let us build three tabernacles. Now, there is this feast called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feasts of Booths. And this is probably occurring during this time. It's something that Jewish people still celebrate. They, they camp out for a period of time as a, a remembrance of how God dwelt with them in the wilderness. And so Peter says, let's make some booths here. Let's make some tabernacles. And it wasn't necessarily a wrong thing to say, but his desire was to remain on the mountain. And the God the Father understands this. And so he, he says, listen to my son. You know, Jesus, 
at his baptism, we know that Jesus was there. We know that the Holy Spirit was there. He descended upon Jesus like a, like in the form of a dove. And we know that the voice from the Father said very, very something similar that he says here in chapter 17 of Matthew. This is my son whom I love. I am well pleased. And then directly after the baptism, which was the commissioning of Jesus' public ministry, he goes into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He didn't remain there in the River Jordan with John the Baptist with the crowd going, oh. he, he went into the desert. He's commissioned. And we see this is going on here. Peter, as well as James and John, wanted to remain on the mountain. And God the Father says, this is my commissioning. You can't stay here. It wasn't so much was what was wrong that Peter wanted to make a, a dwelling place. We're going to get to that in a moment. But he wanted to stay stay there. You can't stay in the mountain. You, you need to go down to the valley. This was a commissioning. Listen to my son, Moses, Elijah. They're all pointing to Jesus. They went out. They had a mission and a commission as well. And this was a commissioning moment. Yes, this was the transfiguration, but this was also a commissioning moment for Peter, James, and John. This is what was said. Here's the fourth observation. This is what is done. And again, you can apply this to any passage of scriptures. You're just making some simple observation. What's the context? What was, what, was, what was seen? What was said? And now here's number four. What was done? Starting up in verse six. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Here's the thing that's going on. Peter made Jesus equal, or Moses, I should say, Moses and Elijah equal to Jesus, three booths. So Jesus is unique. Elijah and Moses are submissive to Jesus. And the mistake that, that Peter was making was treating them all equal. And, and Jesus is not equal. Jesus was the only one who was transfigured on the mountain, Moses and Elijah just appeared. And we see something very interesting here. We see fear, and then we see with Jesus' touch that there's this absence of fear. But Jesus came, and this is verse 7, and said, Arise and do not be afraid, because they fell on their faces afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, no, they saw no one but Jesus. Jesus remains because he is unique. Now, as they came down from the mountain, they're commissioned to go into the valley. Jesus commanded them, saying, tell this vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. They are to keep a secret until the job is done. And then after that, don't you dare keep it a secret. But for a moment, and this... Ever had to keep a secret for a period of time? You know, I, oh, uh, that's hard. But then once, once it's appropriate to reveal that secret, then you're going you're gonna to say it, right? And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first, and he will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come. And they did not know him, but they did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at his hands, at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Now, we don't have time today to go into Malachi chapter 4, but they were referring to Malachi chapter 4 when Elijah was going to appear, and I believe he did in Revelation chapter 11, as well as with Moses. They were the two witnesses, and they pointed and prepared hearts. And they were also suffered, but they also, you know, promoted salvation. And, and so we see here in chapter 11 of Revelation that occurring, we see that this was a prophecy that was given in Malachi chapter 4. And Peter and James and John, they were Jewish boys. They understood this passage of scripture. And Jesus says that is going to occur. But also there's a pre-show and uh, John the Baptist is coming in the power of Elijah. He is preparing people. Prepare, make paths straight. Um, get your heart 
right. The kingdom of God is, is at hand and like Elijah and Moses, who are going to be suffering people who are going to point salvation. We see that John the Baptist is going to suffer. He's going to lose his head. He's going to be beheaded. But it is to point to, sal to salvation. And as they're coming down from this mountain, Jesus says, there is going to come a time when you are going to tell this on the mountain. But until I rise from the dead, keep this secret. It is a commissioning that is happening here. And it's a waiting until Jesus accomplishes here on earth what he was about ready to accomplish in just a few sh short handful of months. Now, those are our observations. Now, here are the applications. Here's number one. Number one is this. Everyone will eventually come to a place and see Jesus. For Peter, James, and John, they were unique. They were given a special window to see the divinity of Jesus. They saw Jesus for who he was in his divine glory. Now, everyone is going to be able to see Jesus after we pass away. And for some, it's going to be a positive experience. For some, not going to be a real positive experience. Hebrews tells us this in chapter 9. It is appointed for men to die once and after this, face judgment. Chapter 4 of Hebrews says this, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, and this is Jesus, but all things are naked or laid bare. This is a hunting term. This means literally the skin, the outside layer, being pulled off from among you, and you are exposed and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Boy, those two verses in Hebrews, not too pleasant. When we meet and look and gaze into the eyes of Jesus, right? Now, for Peter, James, and John, this was a pleasant experience here on earth because they had a relationship with Jesus. And the same is true at the end. When we die, there will be some that do not have a relationship with Christ, and it's going to be judgment, and it's going to be exposed, and they will be laid bare, and their deeds will be seen. But there will be some, and this leads us to number two. Here's the next observation or application. Those who make a dwelling place for Jesus, who hear and who obey and who have been touched by him the way that Peter, James, and John were touched by him on that mountain, do not need to be afraid. You see, this idea of making a dwelling place, you know, the idea of the tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, and that was why Peter wanted to make, he wanted to dwell he wanted them to dwell, and that was a positive thing. Jesus wants to dwell in your heart. He wants to dwell in your life. And we see in this passage of Scripture that there was fear. The voice of the Lord, there was fear, and they were afraid. But with the touch of Jesus, with the intervention of Jesus, with the intercession of him in their lives, and because of his relationship with them, he said, do not be afraid. Now let's jump back to Hebrews, and let me read from chapter Nine. This is right after every man must face judgment. But yet, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Oh, that is good news. But he needs to be received. Let's go to ver or chapter four of Hebrews. After this verse, it says that all things will be laid bare to those to him who we must give account. And then we pick up, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest, Jesus is our high priest, who is, cannot sympathize with our weakness, but has in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. Here's the whole point. Someone is going to pay for your sin. And you see, they're going to be you. And you're going to have that first part of those verses in Hebrews, which is not good. 
or you are going to receive him. You're going to make space for him in your life. You're going to invite him to dwell with you or inside of you with his Holy Spirit. You're going to receive what he has done on the cross. And Jesus, who has paid for your sin, it will be applied to you. It is this commissioning of Peter, James, and John, but also you cannot be commissioned unless you make first space for him to dwell. So here's our third application, right? Not everyone who's going to see Jesus is going to have a positive experience, only those who make a dwelling place for him. And here's our third observation or application. We are commissioned to tell others to prepare themselves and allow a restoration to occur in their lives. We see here that as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell this vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Keep a secret until I rise from the dead and then don't keep it a secret. You know, there was this hymn that I kind of grew up on and said, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere what Jesus Christ has done, you know, that he is Lord. Well, here they have this mountaintop experience. And they had to sit on it for a while. They could not tell anybody what had occurred. It was a secret they were to keep for a while. But when the Son of Man rose from the dead, this is what Peter says in, in 2 Peter chapter 1. For this reason, I will be not negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this, to stir you up my, by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, the booth, the tabernacle. And he's also saying, I am going to not dwell in this physical tent forever. Just as our Lord Jesus showed me, he's referring to this mountaintop experience, Matthew chapter 17. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not allow, follow cunningly devised fables uh, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, referring to the transfiguration here. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when a voice from heaven came from his excellent, excellent glory and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom am I, I am well pleased. He's referring to this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 17 here in Second Peter chapter 1. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. We will no longer keep this secret. Prophecy was meant to be shared. What was happening to Peter, James, and John on the mountain eventually was made was meant to be shared. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is what this passage of Scripture means in Matthew chapter 17, the transfiguration. Jesus is divine. He's commissioning them to go from the mountaintop to the valley. And the same thing for us, he is saying, do not be silent about this. Well, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you strength. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere that Jesus Christ is Lord. Until we meet again, have a great day.